Well, good morning. Welcome to Pine Island United Methodist Church, where we exist to reach people with God's love, transform lives, and change the world. My name is Kaylee Vita. I'm the pastor here. We are thrilled that you're joining us this morning, whether you are here with us in person or whether you're joining us online. If you're joining us online, I'll remind you it's Communion Sunday, so be sure to have your elements ready so you can join us later in the service. The blessing of Father, Son, and Spirit, Holy Trinity, three in one. Be in our meeting and our greeting, in the worship we share and the words of our prayer. The blessing of Father, Spirit, Son, Holy Trinity, three in one. Be in our living and our breathing, that through our hearts and our words, your truth may be heard. Let us stand and worship together this morning.
I invite you all at this time to go and greet your neighbor, say good morning, maybe look at a new face today and welcome them. to your seats. I'll encourage you to find that black book that's at the end of every pew and fill that out. Let us know that you're here today and give us any of your contact information, especially your email, so we can get that on our email list and get you sent out, get sent out our, um, our mobile message that goes out every Wednesday that it has our newsletter and all of the things that are happening here around the church every week. I also want to remind you, to, if you haven't seen it yet, today is your last chance to see the BFG, the Pine, High, Pine Island Playhouses show for this, uh, this season. It's at 2 o'clock this afternoon over in our office building in the LEC. You don't want to miss this fantastic production. A lot of our own uh, people and kids are in this show, and it highlights our very own Paul Pichon, and he does a fabulous job as the big friendly giant, so you do not want to miss this show. Be sure to come out today at 2. Um, also, reminder, VBS coming up a week from tomorrow. Wow, we're so close. So uh, many of you probably already saw we've got a table out in the narthex, all decorated for VBS. It's got a board on there with several post-it notes with several of the supplies that we need. If you feel like you want to help us out, take a post-it note and bring back that supply next Sunday. Um, if you can't do that, if you're not able to do that this week, uh, you can drop a little bit of money in the, in the offering plate to buy a supply, $5 to buy some construction paper would be fabulous. Um, or if you want to put something in the basket out on the table, you can do that too. But um, we encourage you to help us out with VBS. We're looking forward to it. Uh, the food truck party. And um, on the Sunday, I'll tell you now so you can make plans. So. First, let me tell you this, all about food. Next Sunday is our food and fellowship. And the theme this time is barbecue. And we're, they're asking everybody to bring a side and or a dessert to share again. We're gonna celebrate dads and all of the great men in our lives. And then the next Sunday, June 18th, after our VBS celebration in church, we're gonna have at least one food truck maybe two out in the parking lot. So plan to stay that day too for lunch and party with us as we celebrate our food truck party VBS end um, of the week. So, and then also next Saturday, the, well, a week from yesterday, so this coming Saturday, is the men's Saturday Men's Fellowship. They meet at 9 o'clock over in Wesley Hall. They also meet for breakfast and, um, and then have a time of fellowship. So uh, all men, I encourage you to come out on Saturday morning at 9 o'clock to join them for a, t a special time together. And now, Mo, if she wants to come in for the, if any of kids in here want to come up and join Mo and the others for the children's message. Good morning, everybody. How are you today? Good, good, good. So I'm sure you've heard the phrase, sharing is caring. It's something that we all learn when we're kids. <clears throat> um, and what does that mean? That means that when you share something, you're helping someone. That's good. When you're sharing something, you're helping someone. I like that answer. Did you have something, Kason? Um, Yeah, to let someone else have a turn. Yes, I like those answers. Well, guess what else we can share besides just our toys or our, our snacks? We can share our words. And our feelings. And your feelings, yes. You can share things like the Word of God and the Bible and what Jesus means. Jesus wants us to share what he has told us with others. He gave us that privilege to be able to share the love that he gives us with other people. 
And just like the phrase, sharing is caring, it means that we care about other people. We love them and we want them to hear the good news of Jesus that he gives us. Shall we pray? Yeah. Dear, God, Dear God, thank you, thank you. for letting us, for letting us share, your share your word. We will, we will give your love, give your love to others. To others. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. No. As they head out I'll rem and our ushers prepare to come in service today, I'll remind you that there are several ways that you can give, and those are listed for you on the screen. And will you pray with me today? <clears throat> Almighty God, we gather in the name of the one to whom all authority is given, Jesus Christ. As we offer you this money, we ask, you ask us to renew our commitment to be your faith-filled disciples. May our lifestyles reflect a desire to be in mission for others. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. The Lord be with you. We lift up our hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. 
It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. You shared with us your spiritual image, gave us the breath of your holy life, and placed us in the garden of your universe to care for and live in it. But we failed your calling, turned our backs on your presence, and sought after our own understandings. We denied your will and instead fought to establish our dominance over our fellow human beings, even going so far as to deny the presence of your image within each one. Empower us to turn our backs upon this life of sin, most gracious God, and further grant that we will reach out to our sisters and brothers in the body of Christ as we join together with your children in all generations and in glory everlasting to sing the angelic hymn, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of power and might. Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy and gracious Father, you sent your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, to share our human condition. Live as one of us and express your love to all by teaching, preaching, healing, leading, guiding, dying, and rising for us. We thank you for coming to be among us, for sharing with us the heart of your transforming love and acceptance and for giving us your amazing presence through the power of your Holy Spirit. We have not been left alone to seek after your will in darkness, but have been blessed with the light of the scriptures, the tradition of the history of the church universal, our experience with your sanctifying grace and minds capable of reasoning faith. And so having heard your word proclaimed and having offered our prayers as your people, now we gather at this your table to be reunited with your son and with each other, sharing the bread of heaven and being fed with your holy, mysterious, real presence. And so on the night in which he gave himself up for us, gave, he took the bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup. He gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is the, my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many and for the forgiveness of your sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ, Christ is risen, risen. Christ, Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us, the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world, the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. And by your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet through your Son, Jesus Christ, and with your Holy Spirit in your holy church, all glory and honor is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior taught us, let us pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, 
as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we partake of the one loaf. The bread which we break is a sharing in the body of Christ. And the cup over which we give thanks is a sharing in the blood of Christ. Eternal God, we We give give you thanks thanks for this this holy mystery in which which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. In the, we, today we will practice um, intinction, where you come forward, you will receive a piece of bread, you dip it into the cup, and then eat that. I will remind you that in the United Methodist Church, we practice an open table. All are welcome today to come and receive. If you'd like to spend time at the altars after receiving, you're welcome to do so. I do have a gluten-free station if anyone needs that. The ushers will release the roast, starting with the back and moving their way forward, so wait to be released from them.
I'm going to say if Shelly wanted to come up and have a prayer, I guess that would be okay, but she's shaking her head no. <laughs> but I wanted to say a quick thing because I'm standing up here and Pastor Kaylee hasn't yelled at me yet. I hope you all know that during the children's moment, when Mo is talking to the kids, I hope we all know that we have a still childlike spirit in us and that we listen to her message as well. When I did children's ministry, I would say to the kids, this is also for the grown-ups. Sometimes we need that reminder that sharing is caring and to share the word of God. So I hear, hope you hear for the scripture, which is in Matthew 28, verses 16 through 20. This, so... Hear the word of God. Now the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but still some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. And this is the word of God for the people of God. Well, thank you, Pastor Samantha, for helping to lead our service today. Um, today is her last Sunday with us, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, but I've so appreciated her being willing to help um, occasionally here by reading scripture and helping to lead us in communion. Now, last Sunday, we celebrated Pentecost, the day in the church calendar that's all about the Holy Spirit and the giving of that gift to the disciples. We talked about it through the lens of John's gospel. When Jesus appeared in the locked room with the disciples on Easter evening and breathed into them, instructing them to receive the Holy Spirit. Now, Pentecost means three things. The promise of peace, which Jesus gave them, cause for joy, which the disciples experienced upon recognizing Jesus, and then being sent which Jesus did. He sent them as he had been sent, telling them to go and forgive sins, forgive those who don't believe, carrying his mission, Jesus's mission on in the world, the mission of loving the world, not condemning it. Now, this Sunday, the Sunday following Pentecost is referred to in the church calendar as Trinity Sunday. We bring out the white once again, which denotes this day as being a day of joy and festivities. And it is a joy-filled day, much like Christ the King Sunday or Transfiguration Sunday. On this day, we celebrate how great our God is, our triune God, our God who is three in one, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, I might guess that when you heard it was Trinity Sunday, you thought to yourself, wonderful. Pastor Kaylee is going to explain the Trinity to us. <laughs> now, I'm sorry to disappoint all of you, but that is not what I'm going to do today. Because while yes, I could explain it or try to explain it using examples like trees or eggs or clovers or a myriad of other tangible things that have been used over the years to, to try to explain the Trinity, none of them are perfect examples. They all fall a little short in one way or another. So no, I'm not going to try to explain the Trinity to you because, well, I don't think it can be explained. It's one of those beautiful mysteries of this God we serve. 
We use the idea of the Trinity to describe how God is experienced, not necessarily understood. The Trinity opens us to this amazing wonder that is God. We experience God through the both and. God is both holy other and intimate friend. Out there, but in here. God is Father who created all things, including humankind. And that can seem out there, distant. But we also experience Jesus, the Son, Emmanuel, God with us, who became one of us. We read stories of his life, and and that doesn't seem as out there and distant. It's closer. And we experience the Holy Spirit, the presence of God within us and all around us, always, our comforter, our friend, our advocate. It's that nudge that leads us to pray or reach out to a friend. It's what brings us to tears in the middle of a worship service. It's that peace and joy that goes beyond our understanding. And that is in here. One scholar um, this week, that I read this week said, the same God who is God over us as God the Father and Creator and God with and for us as the incarnate Word and Son is also God in and among us as God the Holy Spirit. The beautiful mystery that is this God we worship, our God. And we cannot go into the world without all of that, according to Jesus in today's story from the end of Matthew's Gospel. Now, this scripture that Pastor Samantha read for us is commonly referred to as the Great Commission. Now, I was curious when it became, when it started to be called that because, well, it isn't called that anywhere in scripture. Now, Wikipedia told me that it's not known who coined that phrase. Uh, It's thought to maybe have started with someone named Justinian von Welts but was later popularized by someone named Hudson Taylor. Now, who is Hudson Taylor? Well, he lived in the late 19th century and was a Baptist Christian missionary to China. He founded the China Inland Mission. He spent 54 years in China. Now, his story is really rather interesting, so I encourage you to look him up later. But one historian who was writing around the end of uh, Taylor's life, he, he summarized his life up by saying this, no other missionary in the 19 centuries since the Apostle Paul has had a wider vision and has carried out a more systemized plan of evangelizing a broad geographical area than Hudson Taylor. No one since Paul. And he did what few missionaries had done before. He adopted wearing the native Chinese clothing and he learned their languages so that he could preach in their native tongues. He was sensitive to the Chinese culture, immersing himself in it in order to bring the Christian faith to them. And this is the man thought to have popularized the Great Commission as the phrase we we use to refer to this scripture. And it seems fitting because he lived it out with his very life. But I'm getting ahead of myself because before we get to the commissioning part of this story, we need to know how we even got here. Matthew starts out by telling us that 11 disciples went to Galilee. They are 11 now because Judas is no longer with them. And they're going to Galilee because Jesus told them to through Mary Magdalene and the other Mary. 
because just before this moment in Matthew, we have Matthew's version of the Easter morning tale when these two women, it's Mary Magdalene and the other Mary, went to the tomb. There was an angel there, and that angel gave them instructions to go quickly and tell the disciples that Jesus had been raised from the dead, and he was going ahead of them to Galilee, and there they would see him. So the women left and almost literally ran into Jesus on their way out. And when they saw Jesus, they worshiped him. And then Jesus told them the same thing. Go and tell my brothers, the disciples, to go to Galilee, and there he would see them. So they're following instructions. Off they went to Galilee. And it says, to the mountain to which Jesus directed But Jesus didn't direct them to a mountain, at least that we know of. So here's the thing about mountains. In the Bible, they are more than geographical formations. They are theological signposts. And this is our signpost. They're on a mountain. So something significant is going to happen here. Pay attention. Now, let's consider a lot of very important things have happened on mountains in the Bible, right? Moses received the tablets on which the Ten Commandments were written on a mountain. At the very beginning of Jesus' ministry, he was tempted on a mountain. Earlier in Matthew's gospel, Jesus taught what we now refer to as the Beatitudes on the mountain. In the transfiguration, that day when Moses and Elijah showed up and Jesus shone extra bright, happened on a mountain. The hills are alive. (laughs) Not just with the sound of music, but with the presence and power of God. Something significant is going to happen here. And when the disciples saw him there on that mountain, they worshiped him. That's exactly what the women did too when they ran into Jesus after they'd been at the empty tomb. As soon as they saw him, they worshiped him. When we encounter the risen Jesus, how do we respond? Perhaps. We should follow those first followers' example and worship him for no other reason than because he is our resurrected Lord and Savior. And then Matthew, he sticks this little phrase in there. It's so small, you might have missed it. In fact, I know I have before. It says, but some doubted. Now, it's actually entirely possible to translate that as, but they doubted, meaning all of them. What if that is what happened that day? They saw him, they worshiped, and they doubted. Is it possible to worship and doubt at the same time? to hold the two in tension. Now, the only other place in in Matthew's gospel that this word for doubt is used is in the story of Peter walking on water. The disciples are in a boat, and it's early morning, and Jesus comes walking toward the boat on the water, but the disciples think it's a ghost. I mean, wouldn't you if you saw someone walking on the water? But Jesus speaks, and Peter, bold Peter, he says, if it's really you, tell me to come to you on the water. So Jesus does. And Peter gets going, but then he gets scared, and he starts to sink. And Jesus saves him, and he says to Peter, you of little faith, why did you doubt? So there's that word for doubt. Now, Peter, two chapters later in Matthew, will be the one to say, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And that's the same Peter that just doubted and got scared. 
faith and doubt. They are not mutually exclusive. Here, in our very important story on the mountain, where something significant is going to happen, doubt is not presented as an obstacle to discipleship. Rather, it's presented as an element of it. That word used for doubt, it means to hesitate, to sit on the fence. Literally, to stand in two places. Doubt and worship can coexist. We can doubt. We can have questions. We could be hesitant and worship anyway. Because here's the thing in this story. The doubters, they were still sent It doesn't say that Jesus said only to those who worshiped, go. No, it says he came and he said to them, all of them, go. And go is exciting. It's new, maybe different. But on the other side of go is leave. You have to leave. To go, to move toward a new tomorrow is sometimes to leave a comfortable, perhaps not even comfortable, but familiar yesterday. And that can be uncomfortable and hard. So while hearing Jesus tell us to go can be exciting, it can also be hard. And it's okay to acknowledge that. But Jesus says, go. And he says, go and make disciples. Now, how do we make disciples? Relationship, relationship, relationship. It's not a hammer and anvil. We don't pound them into shape. We make disciples by spending time with people by valuing them, learning from them, knowing them, helping them, telling them what makes you the fully alive person that you are. Much like Hudson Taylor did almost 200 years ago. Discipleship is a process. It's a way of living that we are growing into. So it isn't something you have to perfect before you can go do it. Make disciples as you are being made into a disciple. And make them of all nations. Now, we hear that and we think the world, but the word that's used there is ethnoi. And it's best understood as referring specifically to Gentiles, non-Jews. So what Jesus is telling these very Jewish folks that are standing on this mountain with him is to extend this mission to those beyond their own people. Leave your comfort zone because the reign of heaven is now open to both Jews and Gentiles alike. So in essence, Jesus is saying, invite those who aren't in your circle, to join you. Two important things bubble up from this. Because they're told to go to the Gentiles. So first, we are here today because those followers of Jesus on that mountain did just that. They invited Gentiles to join them. They made disciples beyond their circle of Jews. They got out of their comfort zone. And second, the key word is that they invited. They invited them in. And then Jesus says to baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. There is that trinity that we can't go out into the world without. Baptism, it means cleansing. So seeing as at the time that Matthew was writing, baptism wasn't necessarily a rite of the church like it is today. What if Jesus is referencing a process of being made clean? What if he's saying, give these people that you invite something to define them? 
a way for them to live rather than the way of the world. Give them me, Jesus. Give them a God they can experience as out there and in here. God as Father and, as God, and God as God with us and God as a presence that has been breathed into your very being. And in this way, initiate them into the church, into the body of Christ. And then teach them to obey the commands that I have given you, not by force, but by passion and joy and encouragement. Because the commands that Jesus gave, they aren't about force. They are about love. The commands that Jesus gives us are to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. Include them in what you do and how you live. Invite, initiate, and include. And then Jesus says, remember, I am with you always. That is a promise for each and every person on that mountain. And for all they would invite, initiate, and include in the years to come. It was for those who worshiped and doubted on the mountain that day. And it's for those who worship and doubt today in this sanctuary. Emmanuel, God with us, always and forever, a promise for everyone. The Great Commission, make disciples, baptize, teach. Invite, initiate, and include. That is the mission we are given by the resurrected Jesus, who we worship even in the midst of doubting. We embrace the goodness of God in spite of our doubts. We live into our call to be disciples by making disciples. Jesus told those followers to go. Go with his blessing, with his power in them. Go, reach people for God's love, transform lives, and change the world. And they did. We are living proof. That same blessing and power and mission is ours today. Let's accept it and live into it, church. Now, as we close our service today, as I mentioned up at the beginning of my sermon, today is Pastor Samantha's last Sunday with us. And so I asked her if it's okay, and she said it was. I'm going to ask her to come up, and we're going to, anyone who would like to can come forward and lay hands on her, and we're going to pray for her before we sing today. Um, She'll be leaving Wednesday to head up to uh, Lakeland for our annual conference. And then after annual conference, she's heading home to her parents. She'll split her time between her parents and her sisters because she gets to help take care of her brand new baby nephew. And she'll show you pictures if you want to see. She's a very proud auntie. Um, And so she's going to take a little bit of a personal leave from being a pastor in a church, but she'll still be a pastor and she'll still be doing ministry where she is. Um, And hopefully she'll, in a few months, we'll see her back at a church. But until then, she's, I know you'll help your mom at her church. Her mom is also a United Methodist pastor. So she'll be helping her mom and she'll be helping her sister. Um, And so we're just thankful for her. We're thankful that we could be a place of hope for her uh, during this difficult time, that we could provide a place. I'm thankful for Bob Carlson, who as as soon as I asked him the, the question, if they could put a trailer here for Pastor Samantha, he said, absolutely. And uh, we were able to do that and give her a place to live and to be a part of a community. And I'm thankful for all of you for how you've opened your arms and accepted her and gotten to know her and, um, and, and given her this place here. So um, anybody who would like to, we'll step down here and if you wanna come and lay hands on her and we'll pray over her.
holy God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We thank you for the gift of your beautiful child, Samantha. We thank you for her willingness to serve you. For her, it was full-time ministry, among other things. And we're thankful for the time that we've had with her here. How we've been able to experience you through her, through her gifts and through her, uh, just her warm spirit and her smile. And I'm thankful for this community that welcomed her with open arms. God, we pray for Samantha today as she ventures out to new things. I pray that over the next several months, she finds rest for her soul in you, in her family, in being back in a place where she has her support system to love on her. And I pray during this time that you continue to work in her. I know we don't know what's next, but we know that you are working in her and that your spirit is with her during this time. So we pray a blessing over her that as she goes, she knows that she's now an islander, a pine islander. She takes a little piece of us with her and that we'll always be with her, praying for her and loving her and that she always has a place to come back to. God, we love you and we thank you again for Samantha and what she has meant to our community. Amen.
this week. May you go and invite, initiate, and include. Be the Great Commission out in the world and carry Jesus with you. We're going to have a little reception out in the narthex for Pastor Samantha so you can have a chance to say goodbye and to wish her well and to have a little bite of a cookie on your way out the door today. together for me at the end. All God's people said, amen. amen. Have a wonderful Sunday.